Well, happy Easter. Jesus is alive. That's why we come. That's why we sing. As a church, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ each and every week. We have hope because of all that Christ accomplished for us, all that Christ accomplished on our behalf. He conquered sin and he conquered death. Our greatest enemies in this life, sin and death, are defeated by Jesus. And we live in the light of that truth. And we do get particularly excited at Easter because it is the day that we celebrate Jesus being raised from the dead. And so if you're visiting this morning and you wonder why we sing so loud and why we're so happy, it's for this reason, Jesus. Jesus who died for our sins, Jesus who was raised again. We're not under some delusion that we are better than any other people. We look around at the sin that surrounds us throughout the world and we say, yep, that tracks. That was me too, that is me too. But God being so gracious saved me, forgave me, all because of Jesus, all because Jesus died for me and was raised again. This morning we're going to continue in our study through Paul's letter to the Galatians. If you're visiting today, we've been, we've been going verse by verse through the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. Today we're going to be looking at Galatians 3, verses 19 through 25. Now in this letter, Paul is confronting lies that the Galatian Christians have been believing, have started to believe anyway. They had been taught the gospel. They'd been taught the good news that there is salvation from sins in Jesus Christ alone. That we're saved by faith in what Jesus did on our behalf. But there are some rival teachers who have come into the church in Galatia and they're telling these Galatian Christians that they need more than simply faith in Jesus. They need to do things. They need to be circumcised. They need to obey the law of Moses. And Paul's saying, no way. Jesus did everything for us. He lived the life we could never live, perfect, sinless, and then He died for us. He willingly took the punishment from God the Father for the sins of any and all who would put their trust in Him. So that's, what's, that's what this letter is doing. It's a defense of the one true gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're picking up in the midst of that. So go ahead and stand and follow along as I read Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would be indeed by the law. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace, Lord. You're so gracious. And we stand here now unworthy. But you're so good. You're so kind. You're so merciful, and so we thank you. We thank you for your word, and we ask that you'd help us to understand it. We ask that you'd help us to believe it, and help us to know that it is from you. Pray in Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. 
In verse 19, Paul says, why then the law? Why do we, why do we have the law then, Paul says? If, if what Paul is telling these people, the Galatians, if what he's telling them is true, then why did God give the law? If, it, if the law cannot make someone righteous, if it can't make us what we need to be to get to heaven, then why did God give it to us? And Paul answers his own question. It was added because of transgressions. The law was added or the law was given because of transgressions or because of sins. Now, one of the things Paul is emphasizing in these verses that we're looking at today is that the promise that was made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, which came long before the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, that promise to Abraham is primary. It is better than the covenant with Moses. And we're going to see more of that in the text today. But, but if that's the case, then why need the law in the first place? Why did he give the law in the first place? Romans 5.20, Paul writes there, he says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The message translates that verse this way. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. That's the good news Paul is proclaiming to these Gentiles. The law, Paul says to the Romans, was given to increase the trespass, the sin. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, look at, look at Israel's history. Israel lived their life under the law of Moses. Now, did that lead to a law-abiding society? Not at all. Did it lead to people who were more merciful or better than anyone else on the planet? Not at all. Sin reigned in Israel just as it reigns in us. The law demonstrated, it showed, it revealed that man could not be rescued from sin by their own doing. They couldn't be saved by their own efforts at trying to be good enough. If I live a good enough life, if I follow enough of these rules, then God will let me into heaven. The law was actually given to prove that that's not possible. The law was always meant to be an arrow, an arrow that pointed away from what we could do and toward what only Christ, the Messiah, could and would do. The only answer to the power of sin in our lives was always the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. Paul goes on in the text, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been given. Now that word until is important. What's Paul saying there? The law was always intended to have an end date. It was always meant to be a temporary thing. Now, what was the end date? He says there, when the promised offspring arrived. And that's Jesus. And going along with what I mentioned already about how the promise to Abraham is greater than the law of Moses, Paul says it was given through angels by the hands of an inter intermediary or a mediator. Now, who was that mediator? Moses, right? Moses goes up on the mountain, receives the law. The law is given to Moses, and it says here, by 
angels, and then Moses then mediated the law to the people of Israel. And Paul's saying that gives evidence to the fact that it was, it was a lesser thing than the promise to Abraham. It goes on in verse 20. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Paul's contrasting here the oneness of God with a mediator who stands between two parties. The covenant with Abraham is superior because it's given directly to Abraham by God. In contrast to the mediation between parties that that Paul's telling us here took place with the covenant with Moses, with the law of Moses. Now, why is that important? I'm going to read a quote from one commentator. A mediator involves at least two parties, and in this context, the distance between God and Israel is stressed. Such a view fits with the giving of the law in Exodus, where Moses received the law on the mountain alone and brought it down to Israel. That's in Exodus chapters 19 through 34. Mediation also implies a contract between God and in Israel, therefore, the promises of the covenant were dependent on both parties fulfilling their responsibilities. The Sinai covenant, covenant, that's the law of Moses, failed because Israel did not do what was demanded and broke the stipulations of the covenant. The promise given to Abraham, by contrast, is dependent on God alone. And since it depends on His promise and is not contingent, it will certainly be fulfilled. Now, let me summarize that, okay? God made a covenant with both Abraham and Moses. The covenant with Moses is where we get the law of Moses, the commandments. And that covenant came hundreds of years after the covenant with Abraham. In the covenant with Moses, God uses a mediator, Paul's telling us. The law came from God to angels, to Moses, to the people, which is good. And it doesn't at all reflect on God's relationship to Moses. We know, in fact, that God spoke to Moses face to face. God himself says that. But we have this covenant with Moses that is dependent now on two parties, God being one party and the people being the other party. And then there's the covenant with Abraham that took took place years before that, hundreds of years before that. And that was a covenant where God spoke directly to Abraham. And then in Genesis 15 is the sole party who participated in the covenant itself. Now, that's incredibly significant. God goes through, in Genesis 15, the covenant expression Himself. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Genesis 15, what would take place in that culture was when two people would make a covenant, they would take these animals and they would, they would, they would cut them in half. And they would take these parts of the animals, one on one side, one on the other, and the parties to the covenant would pass between these dead animals that are split in half, and they would say something to the extent of, may it be so to me if I ever break my part of this covenant. And when God makes a covenant with Abraham, He doesn't demand or ask Abraham to pass through the parts of the animals with him. He goes alone. Now, what is that saying and what does that mean? God is taking on himself the responsibility for the fullness of the covenant, our side and his side. It's as if God is saying, may it be so to me if this covenant is ever broken. Well, if you're thinking, well, we know with the covenant of Moses, the people broke the covenant pretty quickly. So what about this one with God, where he's saying that this covenant will not be broken, and if it be so, if it does get broken, may it be so to me and me alone. That's what we celebrate today. The covenant was broken by us, and Jesus did suffer the consequences of the breaking of the covenant on the cross. 
And what Paul is saying here is the covenant with Abraham will be and always will be fulfilled because God goes alone. Notice what Paul says in Galatians. God is one. Romans 3.30, God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. God is one and He will justify. He alone will and is able to justify. He will save the Jews and He will save the Gentiles. There is one God and one way to salvation. As we celebrate Easter today and the resurrection of Jesus, we do it through this truth. God is one. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 proclaims that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. We celebrate that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We celebrate that He revealed Himself to us and through the promise provided for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And our only good response is to love Him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might. He continues in verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Is Paul saying that the law is in contrast to God's promises? And he says there, absolutely not. The law revealed how people should live. But it didn't provide the power to enable human beings to live in a way that pleases God. And so our righteousness, our right standing with God would have to come another way because we cannot obey the law perfectly. The law serves the promise to Abraham in that it shows us that the only way to obtain righteousness is through the cross and grace of Christ, through the seed that was promised to Abraham. One of the main purposes of the law was that it would convict us because we see we can't obey it and then, and then cause us to run to Christ for forgiveness. Verse 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. As humans, we are all imprisoned under sin. Now that's the worst news possible because God's word says that he will judge us according to that that he's so good he's so holy he's so set apart he's so righteous he's so perfect that he has to but his word also assures us that God loves us And so we rejoice in the truth that God made a way for us to be set free. Set free from our imprisonment to sin. Sin keeps us from the promise God made to us. But God sends Jesus to redeem us. To rescue us. To make payment for our sins and set free all who have faith in Him. To those who believe. Promise is given, Paul says, given to those who believe. That's Paul's message through this entire letter. You cannot do enough. You cannot do enough. But Jesus did everything on your behalf. And so the promise is given to you if you trust in Jesus, if you believe in in Jesus and what He accomplished. The promised inheritance is not given to those who observe the law, it's given to those who put their trust in the only one who lived it perfectly. In verse 23, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Before faith came, that's Paul's way of referring to salvation history before Christ. He isn't saying there wasn't any faith there. Wasn't anyone who believed in God before Christ came. We know 
that he's all, Paul's already written that Abraham was counted righteous because he believed. That he was justified by faith because he believed. Paul's saying here that a new era was inaugurated in redemptive history when God fulfilled His promise through Jesus the Son. The law ruled until faith in Christ was revealed. And now that new era has dawned and Christ has come, believers are no longer enslaved to sin. They're no longer enslaved to this present evil age. In verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now, what does it mean that the law was our guardian? Some translations uh, use the word custodian. What does that mean? A custodian or guardian in the ancient world was not simply a teacher of a child. They were more of a child attendant. They were more of a babysitter or a nanny. They would keep watch over children during the years of their immaturity. They would teach them morals and manners. They would attend to them in their daily life. Paul says that's what the law was like. As a guardian, as long as, as they were children. It was enforced for a limited time and functioned as kind of a, a babysitter until the fullness of time came in order, he says, that we might be justified by faith. So that guardian directed us to what could save us. The law drives one to faith in Christ. It displays our inability to observe its commands and guides us to our only hope, which is Jesus. And then verse 25, but now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. Now that Jesus has come and died and was raised, the era of the law, the era of the guardian has ended, Paul says. Now what is it that the law drives us to believe? If it shows us that we're unable to obey God's law, what is it driving us to? How is Jesus the answer to our problem of being enslaved to sin? That's the good news of the gospel. Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth to identify with us. Don't ever forget that. Jesus identified himself with you. You Think of all of your heartache. Think of all of your struggle in this life. Think of all of the brokenness you've experienced. Think of all of the loneliness you feel. The Bible teaches us that Jesus identified himself with you in that. In all ways, he identified himself with you. He identified himself with those who could not obey him. He identified himself with those who had rejected him. Him. Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 2, 5 through 7, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. He willingly came here to dwell among us. That in itself is sacrifice. But that's not his greatest sacrifice. One way that, that Jesus was completely different from us is that he was perfect. Holy. Set apart. The entirety of his life, he never sinned. Imagine that. He lived life on earth without ever sinning. Hebrews says that he was tempted in every way like we all are, but without sin. So he lived a perfect life. He was the only person to ever live who didn't deserve any possible wrong. Totally innocent. But he didn't come to earth to be treated as an innocent 
person. He came to identify with sinners and to set them free from their sin. The Bible says that there's a penalty for sin, and that penalty is death. We see that in the very beginning of the Scriptures in Genesis. We see that in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And so for Jesus to set us free from sin, that penalty had to be paid. Someone had to redeem us, had to pay the cost or penalty of our sin. And that's why Jesus came. Again, Philippians 2 addresses this. He made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was arrested and treated as if he was an insurrectionist, a terrorist. He was tried and convicted, even though he was innocent by people who hated him, and he was crucified. But something significant happens on the cross. Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, Jesus not only takes the punishment from evil people who didn't want him around any longer. God the Father punishes Jesus on the cross for the sins of any and all who would call on his name. Any and all who believe in Jesus and what he did to save them. Jesus takes the punishment for all of them. And he dies and he's buried. But Jesus had promised something. He had told a lot of people, tear down this temple, meaning his body, and I'll rebuild it in three days. He said to other people that he would die, but on the third day he would rise again. And that's what happened. That's what we celebrate today. When his friends went to the place where he was buried on the third day, Sunday, the stone had been moved away from the tomb and Jesus was gone. But not gone where they would never see him again. The Bible, the people God used to write the Bible, tell of times and places that Jesus came to them after he was raised from the dead of what he said to them and how he showed them his scars from being crucified. And after that, and all of the joy of his friends and disciples seeing him alive, the Bible says that he ascended to his Father in heaven where he is now. And it says after he ascended, when all of his followers are looking up to heaven, an angel said to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He will come back. Here in Galatians, Paul is telling these believers and us, do you want to be a part of that promise? Do you want to be a part of this promise that you will be with him forever, that you are God's people? You want to be a part of this inheritance? It's not ever going to come by human effort. It comes by grace alone. It comes by the goodness of God. If you simply believe the gospel, the good news about Jesus and what he did, that you'll be saved. My prayer for you is that it is true of you. That you would trust in Jesus today and always. That you would rejoice in who he is and what he has done. And that you'd love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. We're going to go into a time where we take the Lord's Supper together, the bread and the cup. When Jesus was on earth, when he was with his disciples, before he was arrested and crucified, he was with his disciples in the upper room, and he taught them there. And in the midst of that, he 
gave them, He entrusted to them and then to us this means of feasting with Him, of fellowshipping with Him. And He said, take this bread, and as often as you eat this bread, remember Me. Take this cup and drink it and do it in remembrance of Me. And the bread, He said, represents His body that was broken for us, and His And the cup represents His blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And so, on a weekly basis, we gather and we take the bread and the cup and we do that as an act of remembrance and proclaiming that we really do believe. And not just believe that He died, we're confessing to one another that we believe He died but these also alive and coming back. Paul says, as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And so it's an act of remembering and proclaiming that we do believe. And so I want to encourage you. And I know this is difficult because we have invited you to participate in every single part of our service together. But I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, if you, don't, if you don't believe what I've been talking about up here, then I just encourage you, for this part of the service, as people are dismissed, just kind of hang tight. You'll still be in the midst of people and, and, and probably not noticed. But just kind of hang tight and let this go by because, and here's why, because we believe that you wouldn't even want to proclaim with us that Jesus died and is coming again. And Paul, Paul encourages us that any time we take the bread and the cup, we want to do it in a worthy manner, in a manner that is glorifying to the Lord, in, in a manner that's sincere. And so we'd encourage you that this would be the one part of the service, even as we're all singing together, that this would be the one part of the service. You don't come and take bread and the cup. What I would encourage you is partake of the real thing. These are just symbols Taking communion is not going to save you. Taking communion is not going to get you at another level of of impressing God somehow. It's just a reminder. They're symbols. The bread symbolizing His body that was broken. The cup symbolizing His blood that was poured poured out. And so instead of partaking of the symbols, my encouragement to you today would be partake of the real thing. Partake of Jesus. Consider the things that the Bible teaches about Him, and consider if that's true, if this is actually history, and someone came and said that they were going to die and come back to life, and they actually did that, that changes everything. And so consider the truth of the gospel today. If that's true, then there's a way by simply trusting in Him and following Him and not yourself and hoping in yourself any longer. To be with Him forever. Let me pray. Father, thank You for Your goodness and Your grace. We love You. We praise You for the truth of the gospel. We thank You for Jesus. Jesus for coming and living the way we can't live. Living a perfect life. And then willingly laying down Your life. Being crucified and punished for the things that you didn't do, that we do. And saying to us, that if we would just believe, you would forgive us. And Jesus, we praise you that you didn't stay dead, that you were raised from the dead as a proof that God accepted your sacrifice. And as a promise that for all of us who would trust in you, we too would rise to be with you forever. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.